John Cha once made the comment that when you study the Dharma, you're gathering up lots of concepts. When you practice, you learn how to let them go. That's not the case that gaining the concepts is going to be useless. I mean, the concepts are useful tools. That's why the Buddha talks so much. But we have to use the tools in the right way. Otherwise, we just go around loaded down with this huge sack of tools. And it doesn't accomplish anything. These tools are perceptions. The word is sanya. We translate it in lots of ways. The Thai translation has several translations. One of them is dumb, which means to remember, but also means to fix something in your mind. You look in the Dictionary of the Rajabandit Satan, and they translate jam as gumdot. You fix something in the mind. You label it. You identify and say, this is this and that's that. And it has a huge power over your perception of reality. And whether it has an impact on the reality outside, the Buddha never talks about that. The reality outside of your experience is nothing that he wants to get involved with. He's more concerned with what is your experience and what do these perceptions do. We go around with a lot of perceptions that can weigh us down, can actually cause a lot of suffering. And there are other perceptions that help alleviate the suffering. And there's, there's a point where the perceptions have done their work and you put them aside. That's the correct use of all the different ideas and concepts that we pick up from the, the study of the Dharma. The incorrect use is, is to say, well, there's an ultimate view of reality and there are conventional views of reality. And what we're trying to do is get the ultimate view, which describes things as they really are. And so you latch on to those ideas. Okay, this is ultimate reality, and you hold on to it as if you could hold reality in words. Once you're holding it in words, what do you do with it? You're stuck with that view. You've taken the views and you've taken the Buddhist concepts, and you've used them for the wrong purpose. The real purpose is to see. How can you identify the way you perceive things that's causing suffering, and how can you replace those perceptions with more useful perceptions? And it starts out on the basic level. You know, there's stories about the women crying for their children in the cemetery. In one case, this woman's daughter was named was Jiva, which means to live. And the Buddha said, do you realize that you've buried 84,000 daughters, all named Jiva, here in the cemetery? And that comment was enough to bring the woman to her senses. In other words, the perception, this is my one and only daughter, was replaced by this is one of 84,000. And once you change the perception, it changes the way you look at the events and the way you react to the events, the amount of suffering that those events bring about. Or as he said to another woman, that son that you're crying for, before he was born, where was he? Do you know? He came from you don't know where, and he's gone off to you don't know where. Came as a total stranger. Next time you see him, he'll be a total stranger again. In other words, he was helping her to change the perception of what had happened. 
and her perception was true. This was her only son in this lifetime. But his perception was also true. There are many different ways you can label reality. It's not like we're trying to find the one ultimate way of labeling it. Just asking, by focusing on which aspect of our experience are we causing suffering, and which aspect, when we focus on it, helps alleviate the suffering. Like this sala here, you could think about all the effort went into building it. You could think of how it still has a lot to be desired. You could think about how it's perfectly adequate for our needs. You can think about the fact that its foundations are based on a very movable piece of land. It could fall on us any time. There's lots of different aspects to this sala that you could be focusing on right now. Or you could decide simply that you're not going to focus on the idea of sala at all. Focus on the body. And it doesn't really matter whether there's a sala around it or not. You've just got the bodiness here, which is also a truth. And the Buddha talks about a large part of the meditation is moving from one perception to another. The example he gives is of leaving a populated village and going off into the wilderness. And after all, all the perceptions that go along with being part of the village begin to fall away, fall away, and they begin to, begin to seem strange. It's when you leave the monastery, and the issues in the monastery get further and further away. Or when you leave home, come here to the monastery, your issues of home get further and further away to the point where they become strange. You wonder, why would I ever get tied up in those issues while well, they were around you all the time and just happen to focus on them all the time so they seem natural? But when you're in surroundings where they're not so pressing and not so in your face, you begin to see the amount of stress that they involve. What the Buddha is pointing out is that you could actually go back into the village, if the mind was trained, and be in the village without carrying those perceptions around. You have the choice. But in the beginning, we need to get away. Get away from the events that spark those perceptions. and focus on what we've got right here. As he says, even the perception of wilderness causes disturbances to the mind. You might think about how far away you are from any help, the dangers you're exposed to, the discomforts you're exposed to being in the wilderness. So he says, we'll drop that perception and then just focus on earth. This is his way of getting people into concentration. You could focus on breath as your perception as well. Think of everything as breath energy of one kind or another, particularly here in the body, but it also connects with energy throughout the world. You can think about that as well, because it's not only energy in the body, there's an energy pod around the body. And it may be whole, W-H-O-L-E, or it may be ragged. Your energy pod may be open in different places where you start pulling in the energy of other people, or it can be strong and resilient, resist their energy. You might hold that perception, just energy all around. Even the solid parts of your body are permeated by energy. The bones, John Fung would talk about focusing on the breath energy in your bones not just in your nerves and in your blood vessels, but even the most solid parts of the body, so that there is a level of breath energy that you can experience there as well. You might notice as you drop that perception of solidity and replace it with a perception of energy, 
a lot more things seem possible and how the energy could flow and how you're going to breathe and how the, the breath relates to the different levels of energy in the body. And you see that as you connect the different energy areas of the body, they can nourish one another. So that you have to put less and less energy into the normal activity of breathing, in and out. This is how you get the mind into deeper and deeper concentration, to the point where you really don't have to breathe. The energy sources in the different parts of your body nourish everything else. The mind is still enough so that you don't need a lot of oxygen to nourish the brain. So the oxygen that you get through the pores is perfectly adequate. And so your perception of what breath means begins to change, and the breath needs of the body begin. Your perception of those needs begins to change as well. And as you stay with the stillness of the breath, after a while the idea of holding in mind that perception of having a body sitting here, you begin to see that that has a certain amount of weight that it places on the mind as well. And so you drop that. It gets replaced by the perception of space. You can think of the space that permeates between all the atoms of your body. Or if you're sensing the body simply as a mist of little sensation droplets, okay, there's space between the droplets. And there's no boundary around the body. So if things seem open in all directions, the space opens out in all directions. There's space between the atoms and the sala, the space between the atoms and the ground, space between the atoms and the trees and the mountains all around us. And you can hold that perception in mind as well. In each case, you see that the perception you're holding onto does create a certain amount of burdensomeness, a certain dis disturbance in the mind. And when you can see that disturbance, you let go. And the Buddha, one of his discourses, talks about moving through the different levels of the formless jhanas by appreciating, on the one hand, the lack of disturbance that comes when you get to a more refined perception. And then as you stay long enough with that perception and you settle into it and indulge in it, as the Buddha says, just really hold on to it, learn to enjoy holding on to that perception. Because these are a cool perception of space in all directions, awareness in all directions. But then after all, you see that even though they're pretty cool, they still cause a certain amount of burdensomeness, a, still a certain amount of disturbance to the mind. So you drop them and see what perceptions replace them, and they get more and more refined. So this way you're looking at things in terms of the aggregates, in particular the aggregate of perception. The perception of form is gone, and that what you're left with is feeling, perception, thought fabrication, and consciousness. But even these aggregates are not the ultimate terms. In the text they talk about this being the ultimate description of reality. You've got the five aggregates. But the Buddha advice is going on and saying, well, whatever arises and passes away, you learn how to perceive that simply as stress arising and passing away, regardless of whether it's feeling or perception or fabrication or consciousness. So you drop even those perceptions at one point. Once they've done their work, you move on to seeing everything as stress arising, stress passing away. The purpose of all this is to give rise to a sense of dispassion. You begin to perceive of how much of your experience of the world is made up of these perceptions and the 
the narratives, the thought constructs that they carry in their wake. And regardless of how true or accurate they may be, they also cause a lot of stress. So it's not that you're moving from conventional reality to the ultimate description of reality. You're moving from a way of relating to things that causes stress to a way of relating that doesn't cause stress. And so this is how you use these perceptions and then finally let them go, step by step by step, as they've done their work. This is as John Lee says, when you finally get to the deathless, there is no right or wrong view in the deathless. Right and wrong views is a, an aspect of the path. When you get to the goal, you put them aside. You pick them up as you need them in order to function in the world. But you see very clearly that's why you're picking them up. And your picking up, in this case, is very different from clinging to or holding on. So this is one tool we can use, is that there are many different ways of describing reality, all of which are perfectly accurate. But then you ask yourself, well, for what purpose are you describing it? And to what extent does that particular description cause stress? To what extent is it actually useful for putting an end to stress? That's where the perceptions matter. So we're not getting to, trying to get to an ultimate description of reality. We're trying to get to an end to suffering, two very different things. The Buddha talked not to describe reality out there simply for its own sake. He talks so that, as he said, it's for the purpose of gaining release. This is why we have conversation. This is why he taught. And this is how we, we should learn how to use his teachings. So we can know that release. And when we know the release, we also know exactly how those tools have worked. So we can use them for whatever purposes we may still have, but we're never weighed down by them anymore. <laughs>